Uh, David Loveless spoke a couple weeks ago on identity, began the series. Uh, Pastor Bob spoke last week, did a great job. Um, it's just an exciting series to find out who we are in God. What did the Bible say about who we are in him? That we could really look in the mirror and go, oh, that's who I am. That's who God made me to be. That's what his call is on my life. And so here's a slide. The purpose in life is to become like Jesus, our creator. There is no greater purpose. In him, we see our true identity, living out, becoming like Jesus is our destiny. Our identity is to become like Jesus, and living that out is our destiny in him. The Bible makes it clear, and here's a Bible verse that confirms what I just said. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, becoming like Jesus. That's one of our values, representing Jesus well so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So um, the real goal in life, becoming like Jesus, what does that mean? We're going to be talking about that tonight. And the more um, I know Jesus, the more I want to be like him. Uh, the more, how do you know you know Jesus? Because you want to be like him. <laughs> if you don't want to be like Jesus, it means you don't know him yet. Because he is the most captivating person who ever lived. And so he is drawing us into relationship with him. When you come into his presence, when you come, as we experience tonight in worship, when the word of God is open, when a relationship is opened up, your life is transformed. About 20 or so years ago, my wife and I were traveling as evangelists, and we were in Southern California, and a, a wonderful pastor put us up in a place, our daughters were younger, teenagers, uh, in La Jolla, which is a resort area. And as we were leaving uh, a hotel to leave, uh, getting in our vehicle, uh, these guys about 50 feet away go running by. First one uh, running by, others running after him, yelling, stop him, he stole their purse. And so one guy goes, then two more go, and I don't know, I had my sneakers on, I was younger, I decided I would run. And so I start running, didn't know exactly what was going on, obviously I knew as much at that point as I've told you. Um, but because I had uh, started the race uh, later, they had already been running for a number of blocks. I was fresher, and I was also more youthful than the incredible specimen you see before you now. So uh, <laughs> as time went on, I went from third place to second place to first place. And, but he still, this guy has more incentive really to run at, than I have at that moment. I want to catch him, but he's really running for his life. All of a sudden, our car pulls up, and these two uh, you know, very beautifully dressed ladies in a big fancy car pull up, open the back door. They've got gifts they've been shopping, and they say, hop in. We came from the restaurant. And so I dive in the back of this stranger's car. They peel out, and uh, it's quite exciting at this point. And so we are going now for a couple more blocks, and this guy, you know, we are now in a motorized vehicle. So uh, he's not going to escape. Finally, uh, he sees that. I get out of the car. I then catch up to him. As I'm catching up, he takes the purse and he throws it over a fence. And I want to tell you, those funds help my family so much <laughs> at a time. No, I'm kidding. So I continued on. Someone else got the money. And, and by the time I caught up to him, I had a little time to rest, but we're still breathing heavy. I got him on the ground and I am literally lying on his chest. A crowd is forming. And I figured we just were having a bonding experience there. So uh, I literally said to him, I said, I said, listen, I know that God brought me to you. <laughs> I, it's literally what I said. Again, maybe you would have been more creative at that moment, okay? But that's what I had. So, and I said, I'm a Christian. And at that moment, when I said I'm a Christian, his eyes got incredibly wide and he goes, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> And it was the most unbelievable response. I'm like looking at him. And just to differentiate between the brand of Christianity he was involved in, I said, well, I'm the kind of Christian that doesn't steal women's purses. Anyway, as time went on, he's in the back of the car. He wanted me to go to his trial. I mean, I don't know. He was, at that point, he's very repentant. It's amazing when you're caught in a police car how repentant you can get at that moment. But um, I realized at that moment, I came away going, you know, Gosh, he does, we don't really need him right now to say he's a Christian. <laughs> we need him to be, be a Christian. We don't need any more people on the planet saying they're Christians. We're really full up right now. What we need are people who really are Christians. But it was one of those glaring sentences like, 
gosh. I know, I know, maybe, you know, maybe in, in heaven I'll see him there, I hope to. But, and maybe he'll explain to me that it was an epiphanistic moment, and when he saw me, he really got converted. But anyway, I'm here to, to say that uh, there's, there needs to happen, if we're going to represent Jesus well, then we need to consider what does it mean to represent Jesus? I, I find it a big responsibility. Again, I was an atheist for seven years because of misrepresentation of Jesus. Actually, I, uh, we've been trying to sell our house, and so I went through a, um, a yearbook, high school yearbook, going to a boarding school that was very oppressive and drove me to atheism by the time I was 15. And I made the mistake of going through the pictures of the leaders. And so I just had to finally close the book and put it away because it was bringing up juices in me, you know. But misrepresentation of Jesus is really a hurtsome thing. But representing Jesus well is the greatest privilege that any of us have in life. And so I'm going to talk about that today. I, want to, I, don't, I don't want to be a Christ imposter. I don't want to be the person that makes people want to turn away from following Jesus. I want to be the person that attracts people. I still want to be, all the days of my life, I want to be a representation of Jesus Christ. And I find that it requires then me being honest. Um, Jesus didn't use and abuse people. Um, he didn't say one thing and live another. He was the real deal. And he was so different than the relig religious people of his day. He was so set apart. And what he said, we're going to look at uh, kind of uh, that dimension of his life. But what he said and how he lived was so extraordinary that even today, um, his name is said by more people than any other name in history. Um, and the Bible is read by more people than any other book in history. Because Jesus Christ, to me, is the perfect representation of God come to earth. And so the question is, what is Jesus like? First Peter says this, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Wow, sounds like we're going to do something. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When you see who Jesus is, the revelation of Jesus, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what is God like? He's holy. What is Jesus like? He's holy. Now, at times for me, I don't know about you, the word holy can be a really intimidating word. I mean, like, really? We're supposed to be holy. And so, who gets, you know, quiet people are, <gasps> because the word holy is, is a holy word. And when you think about it, you go, wow, I'm really trying here, but holy, we're, this is a little stretch for me. Anyone feel that way? I mean, I'm supposed to be a pastor, right? Okay, but I'm, I'm a Christian too. How many believe pastors should be Christians? Okay, yeah, so I think if holy is part of the deal, then that's a real big word. He said, be holy. And so I, I found a verse that really did encourage me. First of all, uh, how many of you would say, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but that you are a holy person? and that you live a holy life. Again, if someone said, you know, if someone said that, asked me that question, you know, you, first of all, you're, you're having to be, um, if you're honest, you have to be honest, and you'd have to default then to what you thought holy meant at that moment. Was holy something that required systematic, consistent actions that were so much like God, that you were walking in that holy plane. <laughs> so if that's what it is, I'm just saying. <laughs> if I were to really be honest, holy is a big step. Now again, when we receive what Jesus did. We put on his robes of righteousness. So in our relationship with him, we're not made holy by any human effort, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by his 
grace and mercy, he has saved us. So I wear his robes of righteousness. But again, in terms of behavior, remember that, that the verse began with preparing your minds for action. That's what it said there. So uh, it requires faith without works is dead. It requires some action to live this out. And so I read this verse in Colossians recently. So as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved. Now it's about to tell us what kind of person we need to be if we're going to be holy. Some of you are excited about hearing this. Some of you are concerned, waiting for the shoe to fall. What's about to happen? But it says this, put on a heart of, so now it involves your heart, your inner person. If you're going to, first of all, you're beloved of God. God loves you, loves you, love, 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 loves you to death. He died for you. He loves you so much. But if you're going to be holy, he's about to tell you five dimensions of what it means to be holy. So as those having been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on the heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, I don't know about you. When I read those, I felt better. I, I'm not saying, again, I... I, I have a measure of compassion. I can be kind. I have been kind. I can be humble. I, I have been gentle. I can. Uh, patience, I don't have a lot. I was kind of short-suited on that one. But somehow when I saw that, it actually was incredibly refreshing. Because it wasn't like, and now you're sinless. Faultless. You will do everything right for the rest of your life. You're holy. I'm going, <laughs> just shoot me now, all right? But this gave me hope. Anyone, I, 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 this is your first, it's the first time I'm sharing this. It's a new revelation. Anyone encouraged by those words? Anyone think, bummer? <laughs> Why did he say those five things? Again, I, I, I'm not saying they're a low bar. I'm just saying, these things we can see God using us to do. It's no longer just a bar you could never reach, a height you could never attain to, you know, something way beyond you. Because what that does, that produces Pharisees who walk around <laughs> with this mystique of holiness. And if you look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and that's probably why they were sad, you see. <laughs> if you look at them, just be polite, I'm a grandpa. You're going to laugh at those. I don't see a lot of compassion in the leaders in, in Jesus' day, or kindness, or humility, or gentleness, or patience. And that's why Jesus didn't talk to them very nicely, <laughs> because they were not holy, and they weren't acting holy toward people that needed those five dimensions. So I want to encourage us all. Yeah, it will, it will humble you for your heart to be softened, to believe that is now the filter in part. I know holiness encompasses more than that. I'm not saying this is the length, depth, and breadth of holiness. I'm just saying I'm glad it's a part of the deal. And I, I'm glad it's a part of the definition of holiness because it was liberating for me. It gives me a target that I can aim at. And really, when you think about Jesus, he didn't float around, you know, uh, with little cherubs, and uh, he was a real guy, and I saw him demonstrate compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And that's why I fell in love with him. So, let's take a look at that. My message is identity, being holy. <laughs> and if I had started out, we're going to talk about you being holy. You better be holy. Because <laughs> God said, be holy. <laughs> and he's big. <laughs> How many would like to hear that message? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, as we have mentioned, the leaders in his day you know, who did Jesus minister to? Think of, first of all, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests' relationship to people like lepers, 
the physically impaired, Samaritans, which were half-breeds, half-Jew, half-Gentile, tax collectors, Galileans, their enemies, or just plain sinners. How did the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, treat those people? How did Jesus treat them? You know, the Pharisees were rigid and proud and harsh and uncompassionate and impatient. Jesus, what did he do? How did he treat, again, the lepers? He laid his hands on them. The physically impaired, he, he, he imparted life to them. He gave them virtue. Uh, Samaritans, the woman at the well, you know, not being ashamed to talk to her, even though his disciples were ashamed that he was talking to her. He was not ashamed to be a friend of publicans, which means tax, tax collectors and sinners. Galileans, he's part of a group that was mocked within the Jewish community. Um, how about enemies? The first person in history to say, you know what? You've heard it said, you know, love your friends and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies. The people who have treated you the worst in your life, these are the people that you are called to love. And the reason why Christianity spread like a holy virus is because as Christians were dying and being martyred, they were loving the people who were sending them to their death. And it was so diabolically different that all of a sudden their captors became Christians. And the Bible says in the book of Acts that many of the priests began to be believers. And all of a sudden, it began to spread because they really were holy. Not little mystique, not the air of holiness, but the genuine heart. So let's examine these five words. The Greek meaning of these words describing holiness, compassion, a heart of mercy, the inner depths where compassion resides. You know, I, part of me, you know, just listening to Brett lead worship tonight, and, you know, he's just an all-in guy. He's not, he's not coming up here doing some little slick song set. He's sharing his whole life. And that's really what we want. If we're not going to get that, you're going to get some kind of processed, you know, MSG message, you know, with stuff in there like, gosh, it didn't sound like a real person was talking or singing. And I'm, I, again, I'm one of those guys, you hear me talk about this only periodically because you couldn't handle it if I talk about it all the time, but I'm a guy who believes for a move of God. And without a move of God, I don't want to leave this earth. I, I've seen a move of God. I got saved in a move of God. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for Jesus to take over rooms. And it's got to start with me. It's got to start with you. So when I hear about this, I go, wow. I want the inner depths of compassion to reside in me. I have received a lot of mercy. As a matter of fact, I have received more mercy than anyone I've ever met. Because I know the mercy I've received. And I know his mercies are new every morning. And I know it's not me having to put on these airs, this pretense of being together. Because I'm not together. But the one I serve loves me like I am. And every day he can't wait to be with me. And he's more excited about me being with him than I could ever be being with him. So I want to search the depths of compassion. I want to see Jesus when he saw the multitudes, when he saw the need, he had a heart that was filled with compassion. Second word there, kindness, moral goodness, and integrity. You know, when my wife and kids, when my daughters say, my dad's a man of integrity, wow. I don't know if there's a more powerful word for me. You know, my natural father was approached by his daughter in a restaurant when he was with a prostitute. And my sister said to him, what are you doing? What are you doing with this woman? I want to be a man of integrity. You know, my again, this reunion, I have two brothers and two sisters. One spouse has gone home, it's gone dead. But all nine of us that are left all love the Lord. 
And we had a powerful prayer time. And we discussed this very verse. And we prayed for our kids and our grandkids. Because we really have been rescued. All of us have been rescued. And we concluded at the end of our time, even though we're very concerned about the world, concerned about those who have come from our loins, uh, the most significant thing to me, prophetic essence, was the fact that all of us are passionate for God and could spend a hot half hour praying and interceding. That was the best thing, that we are still, 40 years later, in pursuit of the one who's rescued us. How many of you want to follow a God who's a liar? Who says one thing and does another? See, that's the thing about Jesus. Jesus, he said, when I am risen, you know, after I'm dead. See, every, uh, every other person, all the other leaders of religious sects, they're dead. Gone. Jesus was the only one who said, I will die and then I will rise again. That was the essence of his prediction. And 500 plus people saw him. And because they knew he was the real deal, they saw the resurrected, they saw him die, they saw him resurrected, then they were willing to die for them, for him. And many of them did. Most of the early apostles did. Third word for holiness, humility. Defined, having a humble opinion of oneself. A deep sense of one, I love this, a deep sense of one's moral littleness. You're just a little moral person. <laughs> Isn't that great? Littleness. You can look it up in, in the Strong's. Modesty and lowliness of mind. You know, God knows we need a lot more lowliness of mind. You can feel as low as you want to about yourself. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And learn of me. The amazing thing is that the God of the universe who sits on a throne is a humble servant. <laughs> he looks more like Mother Teresa than Donald Trump. I'm just saying. Do you understand that? <laughs> I've never thought that or said that before. And I like, <laughs> you can email me at France at Rock and Rosal and tell me if you think that is a horrible metaphor. I have no idea. <laughs> but you, you got to get a glimpse of who you're supposed to become like. If you got the wrong glimpse, you're becoming like the wrong person. That's what really puts a great responsibility on my life. It starts with my own kids and grandkids, and then it spreads to anyone I influence. And I want to infect you. <laughs> because I don't want after someone's tracked you down and is lying on your chest because you've stolen something, and you go, well, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> I go to the Rock of Rose. <laughs> Please don't say that. David said, I am a worm and not a man. I've been a worm. I've been a few. I've been a toad. I've been a weasel. I've been a number of little creatures in my life. The point I'm making is I'm not impressed with me because I know me. If anyone needs a savior, it is me. How many of you are glad that God is not this cocky God? You know, this, you guys are going to submit, you know. I find the word humble, really, for me, candidly, the word humble has just been used so much. I just, I just had lost all its oomph. And so I went to the word, from humble, I segued to the word humiliated. And I realized if you look it up, it's not going to be good. And I realized humiliated is overstated. But somehow it was much closer to what I wanted to feel than humble. 
know what I'm saying? Humiliated. It's hard to get a lot of breath with humiliated. Being humiliated, you really have decreased. There really is a, and there really is, I believe a move of God comes in a person or in a group when they are fully empty. When God goes, you know what? There's so little of them left. They've made enough room for me. Make room for me, and I'll come into your life. That's what God's saying to us. I, I believe humble has been oversaid and underlived. But be humiliated, and you'll get closer. The fourth word, gentleness. Mildness of disposition. Gentleness of spirit, meekness. Gentle is not weak. In order to be killed and be compliant simultaneously, you have to be, and I, I really did see that in the 21 Coptic Christians who were being led, I never saw the video. I guess there is a video. I didn't really want to see it. I guess I couldn't. I didn't show the whole thing, but a video of them being led out. But just them kneeling, there was something about their, they were going to their death. And none of them said, I I'm willing to convert. I I'm done here. They gave their lives for Jesus. And the irony of it is, is the people who were killing them were thinking they were showing the world how big and bad they were. Actually, they were less little and bad. But those who died for him and we, we get an opportunity to die every day. Every day it's written in the script for you to die to yourself. Some situation where you and I can die. The psalmist wrote, God's gentleness has made me great. That's what the psalmist said. God's gentleness has made me. In fact, you know God's been gentle with you. Do you know that? Any of you been bullied by God and notice he just kind of throws you around the room? Has he been patient with you? When I would, my mother would pray over her food, the little Italian lady, and I would laugh aloud as she prayed over her food, mocking her. If I was a bully god, you know, Francis, you're done. Gosh, you're out of here. But he was gentle, patient with me. And it's the last word, patience, endurance, constancy, steadfastness, perseverance, forbearance, long-suffering. I know we all love, you know, love, joy, peace, but long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness, fruit of the Spirit. Self-control, the anti-American value. Self-control. And slowness to in avenging wrongs. Those are great qualities. To be holy, that's holy. That's holy. A picture of holy there in a beautiful way. Hebrews 12 says, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. It's interesting when it, you know, all those qualities really, gentleness and kindness, all those qualities really were demonstrating peace toward people. And so when, when it talks about being peaceful, it talks about be like Jesus with people, and then you can be holy. You have to forgive people, turn the cheek and run the extra mile and lay your life down for them. Dave, that's why David was called a man after God's heart. Here's one scene in the life of David. I, I just, I went away on a, time of prayer and fasting a few months ago and just read 1st, 2nd Samuel and just devoured it, just the life of David. And I just, this man was so extraordinary. Just one scene here. David, a man about whom the book of Acts says, God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man who's kind of like me. He's holy like me. He's kind and gentle and forgiving and patient. This is, again, I'm not saying every second of his life, nor will we be every second of our lives. But he had those qualities. He will do everything I want him to do. So at one tragic moment, King David is fleeing from his son, Absalom, who wants to kill him. Now again, I can't think of a more tragic sentence than you fleeing from your son because they're trying to kill you. This is a rather low moment in any life. And the son, arrogant, wanted to make himself king. But it happened. So 2 Samuel 16, 5. When King David came to Behurin, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. Okay, Saul was the previous king, bad guy, 
began small in his own eyes, became puffed up. The kingdom was taken away from him, became an arch enemy of David, tried to kill him. And David, again, was Saul as Saul was in a cave, got close to Saul, cut off part of his garment, and then showed him, I could have killed you, I didn't kill you. And then had a lucid moment, Saul says, you're right, you know, you're better than I am. But later on, took a javelin, wanted to kill him. And so this guy, Saul, had a family member who was angry that Saul had been killed. And Saul was killed in a battle. David didn't do it. Saul and his sons were killed in a battle, whose name was Shimei, the son of Jirah. And as he came, he cursed. He's coming at David. David is now leaving. Rather than fight his son, he's now leaving and in humility walking. And here comes this guy. And he's cursing at David constantly. And he's throwing stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And and look who else is here. And all the people and all the mighty men on David's right hand and left. And if David had any kind of chip on his shoulder, he said, you know what? Take him out. Kill him. But David, even what David said to him... um, and I don't have all the verse here, but he said to them, who knows, maybe God brought him out here to say those things to me. What kind of a... And I can just see, you know, Jesus who would come. That's why he said, I'm the son of David. Do you like those qualities David had? That, that's, that's the kind of background. I, I want to have that response. And Jesus, again, could have called down 12 legions of angels but he took it. He absorbed it. Are we that kind of people that absorb? Because you may notice being a Christian, a genuine Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, not a politically correct Christian, but a Bible-believing Christian is going to cost you something. It's on the menu. It's up around the bend. It'll cost something at work, with your family, for you to speak up. Not an arrogance, not a cockiness, but to live a life that genuinely demonstrates the life of Jesus and not just roll over in fear or unbelief or hiding, but saying, this is what I believe. So Shimei had a a grudge against David. And David wrote about this in the Psalms. He said, but I am a worm about this event, and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. During a battle between the armies of David and Absalom, Absalom was killed, and David's restored to the throne. Now David is traveling back to Jerusalem, and there's Shimei. And Shimei is kind of shimmying up next to him. <laughs> and Shimei is humbling himself before the king and begins to apologize. This is a little weasel. <laughs> and the king about to cross the river, Shimei fell down before him. My lord, the king, please forgive me. He pleaded, forget the terrible thing. This is the guy. I'm a Christian too. This is the same deal here. (laughs) Forget the terrible thing your servant did when you left Jerusalem. May the king put it out of his mind. I know I I have much I sinned. That is why I have come here today, the very first person in all Israel, to greet my lord, the king. I'm sorry. It's just hard to really believe the genuineness of the moment. Then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said Shimei should die. Same guy. This is Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Zeruiah, was leaving with David. Same, he's still here. He is not, he's maybe working out a little bit since he's been gone, but he's still fully capable of killing that guy. And now he thinks this is a great opportunity. Let me do it. Who asked your opinion, you sons of Zeruiah? So here's David. David reproves the guy who's ready to defend his honor and kill him. You sons of Zeruiah, I can't say it. David exclaimed, why have you become my adversary today? This is not a day of execution. For today, I am once again the king of Israel. Then he turned to Shimei, David vowed your life will be spared. So in closing, someone come to the keyboard if you would. How many of you have had your life spared? How many have had your life spared? I will always deserve to be in hell, always. 
throughout all eternity. But I'm just not going to be there because someone took my punishment for my sin. David said, this is not a day. Do you know what today is? I believe I'm going to go back to it. Today is a day of mercy, not judgment, of compassion. Today is a day of kindness, not callousness, of gentleness, not harshness. Today is a day of humility and not pride. Today is a day of patience and being anxious for absolutely nothing. of you want to be holy men and women? The response tonight is not, I'm going to respond because from now on, I'm going to do everything right. From now on, you're going to see such a change in me. I am going to, I'm going to, I'm telling you, I'm going to do everything I'm supposed to from this moment on. I can't do that. <laughs> and I can't invite you to do something you can't do either. But I want to invite you, let's all stand together. I want to invite you. If you say, you know what, I could really use some more kindness. <laughs> Man, I really need a triple dip of patience. I need some, some mercy in my life. I need to, to have patience that I don't have in me. And so I'm going to ask God to help me. If tonight you want more compassion, I'm going to invite you to come for a few minutes. Bow before, I'm going to bow before the Lord. I, want, I don't want to just say these words. He that is a hearer of the word and goes away doesn't pursue that deceives himself. And so I'm going to kneel before the Lord because I want more compassion. I want to invite you to come and just come to the altar tonight. You ask Jesus to give you compassion, give you kindness, give you gentleness, humility, and patience. You want to make that your new identity. And you're going to say tonight, Lord, I'll, this is my desire to be a holy person before you. That I'm not going to represent you in a holy way by being arrogant and cocky and self-righteous and putting on this air, this mystique that I'm really together and 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 self-righteousness. But I wanted humility, Lord, to have compassion. I don't think it's an accident that you heard such a beautiful testimony tonight from Teen Challenge from Kristen, because I believe the Holy Spirit transformed a life and he wants to transform our lives so maybe you're still a person who's not come forward because you're thinking I don't really need it well you probably need it the most then I want to be this kind of person I'm not ashamed to bow before Jesus I'm not ashamed to let everyone know I need to be more kind and more compassionate and more gentle and more humble and more patient and I want that to be my identity I don't want to leave this earth impressing anyone. I want to impress Jesus. Because he knows the thoughts and the intents of my heart. He knows the motive behind every word and action and thing I do. He, I want to be like him. Because he's the one that impacted my life. He's the one that died for my sins. He's the one that I, I want to surrender every part of me. Every part of me that's resistant. I surrender. I do like that song. It talked about running through the fields, going back to the beginning. Something there, something fresh between you and God. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit that you would fall upon our lives, God. That you came a humble servant. You were in obscurity for 30 years. And even when you finally revealed yourself, you revealed yourself not as this, this arrogant person, but this humble man who was willing to touch those who were the untouchables, reach out to those who had been rejected, those who had been, a, been overlooked and discarded. Lord, you rescued us, Lord. And though there are not many mighty who will ever receive you on this earth, Lord, not many will ever come to know you. 
Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go that way, and now is the way that leads to life, Lord. We desire to be those that represent you well, to represent true holiness, not the mystique, not the air, not the facade, but the genuine holiness of kindness, of humility, of compassion, of gentleness, and patience toward our spouses, toward our parents, toward our children, toward our co-laborers, toward our friends, toward our enemies, toward our neighbors, toward every person in our life, God. Maybe you're reflecting on specific person in your heart you know you really need to ask their forgiveness thank you Lord it's like to lead us in a prayer just pray from your heart just want to put some words. The Bible talks about death and life and the power of the tongue, something we say if we say it sincerely, even though someone may guide us in it, if it's genuine, it has power. So would you pray, Heavenly Father, I bow before you, a holy God, who sent your son Jesus who modeled your holiness. He was compassionate. He was kind. He was gentle. He was humble. He was patient. I want to be like him. Make me a compassionate person. Make me a kind person. Make me a gentle person. Make me a humble person. Make me a patient person. Let that be my identity. Make me holy like you. So, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, and we thank you that you, you don't come as beggars, you come as sons and daughters. We bow before you because you are our Lord, our King, our God, our Savior. You're worthy, and we honor you tonight. We bow before you. We bow our hearts and say, we believe you hear our prayers. And we pray that the prayers we pray, that the word would become flesh in us, Lord. That your original intention, as Romans 8, 29 said, was that we would be conformed to your image. We would be transformed into your likeness. Would you do that in us, Lord? I bless you, Lord. I honor you. I thank you for this church family. I thank you for those who are here, who sincerely, I look in their eyes and I see sincerity, I see genuineness, I see a desire to grow and change, to repent, to be the people that you've called us to be, and I honor you for that, Lord. I pray it would be in us, in this church, in this region, all the churches, all the believers, Lord, that a move of your spirit sweep across this region, God, with all the consternation and anger and division and polarization in our nation, all the division. Let this, let this be a place of unity where believers, like the book of Acts, had all things in common, esteemed each other as more important than themselves. Let that same spirit that was in Christ Jesus be in us, that 
we would make your joy full, Lord. We honor you tonight. We bless you. Thank you for your sweet presence here tonight, Lord. We honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.